<laughs> Welcome everybody to That Reminds Me Of. I'm the Doc and I'm here with the Baron. Hello, Baron. Hey, Doc. How are you, man? Very well. Today we're talking about Wonder Woman 84. That's right. And this is the show, if you haven't been with us before, where we talk about films and the films that we're reminded of while watching those films. And there are spoilers. So carry on if you're okay with that. We're coming to, to you live today from Palace Cinemas in Pentridge yes. again for the yes. second, second episode running because we loved it so much the first oh, time. Oh, it's so good. And we've discovered a new space, which is almost like a function space off to the side. It's a little quieter, so there'll be less doors banging and things this time around. My background looks a little cooler than yours. It does. Mine's the dodgy window and, <laughs> and side door. Yours is the like, you know, nice lights in the background. And that's where you go in to see the movies, right behind you over there. Yeah, and I would recommend to anyone in Melbourne, uh, you can't visit Melbourne from overseas at the moment, clearly, but if you're in Melbourne, come to the Palace Cinemas in Pentridge. It's Check out cool. the new cinemas, and they've got all the all new recliner chairs. They're quite small cinemas, but they're, it, that's in a good way, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, the screen, compared to how far away you are, is quite large. They're, they've got the new recliners. Uh, there's 15 screens, so there's plenty, of, plenty going on here. Yeah. And... More importantly, you can buy booze. That's like a palace thing. That's, that's just that's correct. And what's this one called, Baron? Uh, you actually you, you it was something uh, about the Baron. It's Tell called me. the Summon the Baron. Summon the Baron. That's crazy. <laughs> and um, it's actually sort of a take on a dark and stormy. I think. I don't know what it is, but it's doing the trick. It's um, working for I me. I like it. It's working for me. Uh, and it feels like the right the right drink to get us through this episode, where we're going to talk about Wonder Woman. 1984, mm. and shall I start with a little synopsis, or not even a synopsis, just, just a little just setup. Set just, us up, Baron. Set okay. us up. So, you've seen 19, you've, you've seen Wonder Woman 1, um, mm. you know who she is, right? I think we'll just assume that level of knowledge of Wonder Woman. Well, this is um, 1984 now, we've jumped forward from World War One. I, I think the first film takes mm. place in, to 84. Um, and I don't even, I don't know exactly why we're in 84. I think that there's a bit of a love of the 80s, maybe, that's, that's going on there. And, and uh, maybe the excesses of the 80s that were a part of that yeah. time. Anyway, um, she's working in the Smithsonian. Um, she's sort of keeping her head down and occasionally going out and saving the day, uh, Superman style, or Wonder Woman style. <laughs> Uh, where you will just catch a flash of red and blue and gold yeah. as she goes and, you know, save someone in a mall or on the street. And then uh, what lands in her lap one day is, first of all, a new lady who's joined the team, who's a gemologist, I think it is. Kristen Wiig. Kristen Wiig, and her character's name is Barbara Minerva. Minerva. And uh, at the same time as her arriving, uh, we've also got this mysterious collection of of stolen goods that have arrived that the FBI want identified and in the middle of it is this particularly strange looking gem that looks like it's out of the dark crystal uh, that grants wishes which is what we discover at first you don't know what it is but this thing yeah. grants wishes and um, Barbara's character wishes to be as cool as as Diana who is Wonder Woman um, and even when she's not Wonder Woman she's cool and someone who, who you might wish to be I, I suppose and then um, Wonder Woman or Diana wishes, just for some reason, that she could have uh, Trevor, her, 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 her boyfriend back. Her boyfriend. Is it Trevor Scott or Scott Trevor? No, I don't know. I can't remember. Trevor something or other. Uh, Chris Pine. Yeah. Her boyfriend back, who we lost in Wonder Woman 1. And eventually this goes off, this stone goes off to um, fall into the hands through lots of devious plots of... Um, the guy who's played by Pedro Pascal, Max Lord, who's just like a big TV personality, Donald Trumpian style dude who wants <laughs> to rule the world and has been hunting this, this gem. Uh, he gets it and things happen. Mm. So that's probably a setup. I think that's, that's what we need to get going here. It's got the bits and pieces required and we can talk, we can dive into the story from oh. there. Wow, well, I just wish I had that dark crystal thing. Yeah because I would have wished so many things through this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so that I wish would have wished that so many things were just that little bit different. Oh my personally. God. Okay, so you're, you're getting straight into, which is good, I think, overall thoughts. What were your overall vibes of this film? 
did it sit with you right or not? No, it didn't sit with me right, but that's not to say it wasn't fun. Like it kind of was fun and had a lot of elements that I enjoyed. Yeah. But th they had a lot of plausibility kind of gaps and stuff that I just didn't sit well with me. Yeah. I don't know if everyone can also hear this music, but it kind of reminded me of the day the music died. Yeah, this, no, <laughs> the, the really. day the DC <laughs> franchise died. <laughs> the day the DC franchise, and uh, no, it, it was yeah. There was there were there were big issues for me yeah. with this film, and I agree there were things in it that were fun, but I think a big part of it was that it wasn't that fun and it wasn't that funny, and you, mm. you're watching Kristen Wiig thinking this should be hilarious. There mm. should be some comedy woven in here. And what was there was just kind of lame, you know, like it didn't really mm. hit the point, hit, hit the mark at all. I thought about that point a lot. Mm. And I don't think it was that there was, there was no humour because there was heaps of humour and Kristen Wiig I thought was funny. But, uh, like she's just a funny chick. Yeah. Uh, but the problem was you've got this cartoonish version of a superhero movie and the main superhero is not funny. Yeah. She's, Gal Gadot, she's got such presence and she's cool. But she played it like she played the Imagine video. You know, the one that got mocked by everybody? <laughs> yes, yes. Just really serious. So, yeah. typically you have, like, the Cape Crusaders, you know, like, or Spider-Man, you know, giving, you know, uh, one-liners all throughout the movie. But she's just flat melodrama yep. while nonsensical things are going on, along, going on around her. I completely agree. And nonsensical things going on around here is, her is a really good point because that was something I could not wrap my head around while mm. I was watching this. I should just add too that her name is pronounced Gal Gadot and really? it throws, apparently, it throws me every time because I always want to say Gal Gadot as well because oh, wow. it sounds way cooler. Gal Gadot? Apparently it's Gal Gadot. Wow. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, um, I'm going to run with Gal then. You're going to, yeah, just go with Gal. Yeah. She is stunning right visually and just with her energy and her her earnestness kind of encapsulates what wonder woman is right i yeah. think she does that part of it really well she does she's awesome she's perfect yes yes but, but you're right <laughs> this is 1984 the world that they're presenting to us is ridiculous it's like they've taken some of stranger things yeah. and they've and they've taken some of everyone's favorite childhood films from the 80s and tried to weave it in, but mm. she has remained the same, untouched somehow. Yeah. Really odd. Really odd. And I wonder if they were aware of that, if that was a choice. I can imagine how it could be a choice because they're trying to keep her as a serious character. They're, they're also perhaps trying to link, link it up with the other films in the franchise. And this is something I don't quite get because some of the other films, they play on being a bit darker. Mm. at times like you yeah. look at the batman universe that wonder woman enters into yep uh and it's a completely different yeah, vibe totally. and i don't mind that it's a bit different sometimes but they don't seem in the same family i totally agree here's a question have you seen the first film before this one i have i don't remember it very well mm. but i like it was world war one it wasn't as sort of kitschy that's no, for sure definitely wasn't but at the same time it had some of the downfallings of this film, I think, in it. Mm. Uh, did you come to this film with any expectations about where it was going to lead you? Yeah, we should have started with this. Mm. I, I came full of hope and nervous energy and expectation. Is yeah. I, I really liked the, like the artwork of Wonder Woman 84 and the posters I'd seen that were kind of Technicolor. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thought that this was going to really be fun. There was an opportunity for that, wasn't there? Yeah, mm, but, but I also thought, because I'd heard about, is it Jack Snyder? Is that his name? Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder. Yeah, Zack Snyder. Um, I've heard that he's redoing the uh, director's cut of Justice League. Yeah. Which includes Wonder Woman and all the others. Yeah. Uh, and will take it in a darker direction. Oh, okay. Which I think everyone probably hoped for, right? Everyone hoped for, and I think yeah. that was his intention. Yeah. So I went into this thinking, okay, we're going to get a dark, gritty Wonder Woman, mm. but somehow they're going to infuse that with some sort of 80s fun, and I didn't know how it was going to go. Yeah. But in the end, you just get this big joke of a film. You know, we've, we've talked in the past about executives getting involved in films mm. a few times, and 
I find that all of the DC Universe stuff seems to be confused. They bring in a director and then, and then the whole thing seems to feel like the direction that it's meant to be going in is being second guessed the whole time or maybe there's two directions yeah, that are opposing yeah. each other. This film feels like it's that again. Probably as bad or worse that you know than some of the other films in, in yeah. the DC franchise. So I just wonder why they're not learning from the lesson of the, yeah. of the previous films. Don't know. Or if they think that it's, they are and it's fine. I thought they were learning and that's why they were redoing Justice League. And, but right. this doesn't feel like lessons learned. What did you come in, into it thinking? Well, I came into a little like preparing myself to be conflicted about the You film. did, okay. Yes, because uh, the first Wonder Woman, everybody loved. Like it was just almost universally lauded, it seemed. And did you? And I really didn't like it. And I think one of the issues is, for me, I've had a, this issue with other films before, mm. is that a huge step is taken forward in that we have a really strong female superhero yeah. who is the headliner, the leading character and of, of this film. She's not mm. part of a team, it's, it's a Wonder Woman film. Yeah. But it seems like that then allows people to overlook all the other flaws in the film. <laughs> and I find it almost impossible to overlook all the other flaws in the film. And it's not yeah. enough. I came out of it going, wow, I think that's great. Yeah. But what about all the other crap that was in the film? Like, does yeah. that, no one else bothered by that? Like, it's really disturbing for me. Um, and I also thought that the whole fact that we'd get to the end of the film and Chris Pine, his sacrifice is what allows Wonder Woman to unleash all of her power. And we almost have it again in this film. I thought that was the weakest part of mm. the first Wonder Woman film. And it comes around again this time yeah. in, a, in, a, in a different way. But, you know, there's, there's similar ideas bubbling around in there. And I just don't know that we're really taking the step forward that we think we are with these films. There's, you know? no, there's no step forward. Right, <laughs> okay. And it, it seems like it's all just, yes, it's a, it's a female lead, a powerful woman, but it's as if it's all merchandising yep. and, and just fluff and yeah. messaging and no real substance to it. So Gal Gadot is like the, the perfect sort of embodiment of what you think. If you're gonna take the comic of Wonder Woman and turn, mm that comic into a real human being. However, most of what's in that image that comes out of the comic is quite ridiculous if you think yeah. about it. Like you've got this warrior woman who looks like a catwalk walk model and dresses up in the most ridiculous outfit possible for fighting. <laughs> and um, that's acceptable. And there's even a whole discussion about heels and getting around in heels and yet, and, and how hard that is. And then all of the costumes when they when they finally kind of kicking ass mm. the heels are still there it just makes no sense whatsoever mm. really that decision about the costume had to have been made in the first film but i would yeah. have loved to have seen something a little more practical come out of it it's a hard one though because like that's how we know wonder woman yeah but that don't you think the, the magic of cinema and you yeah. know the power that hollywood has bringing someone like they bring someone like gal in i think that's a that's an opportunity to redesign you yeah know? it is and some, some of the costume discussions in these films, not discussions, how they deal with co the costumes yeah. are really interesting. Spider-Man versions where you, you have him first make a dodgy version of it himself yes. and then gradually some high-tech billionaire comes in and invents a suit that looks the same but is, you know, sticks to your skin or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure we've been on that journey with Wonder Woman, have we? Within the films, have we discussed her costume and why she's wearing this get up no i think it's because of that whole island with all the the amazons uh, it's almost like yeah. she comes packaged she has That's everything right. already there were times in this where i couldn't help but probably because the costume thing bothers me still mm. watching and thinking if that were truly made of metal <laughs> that thing and it's got these edges she would have stabbed herself in the mm. boobs about you know 30 times throughout the film just mm. irreparable damage would have been done from the metal edges alone. <laughs> anyway, how about that other suit that she puts on at the end? Is that from comic book history? Oh, I guess it must be, but it just seemed to come from nowhere, have no reason for being. Mm. And it was at exactly the same time that Kristen Wiig turned into a cat. For some reason. For some reason. Where, like, why did she turn into a cat? The only link I could place, and I guess this is a great, because this is, this is throughout the film. This is, these are two... Yeah incredibly lazy writing plot turns that mm. I think we have lots of them throughout the whole film, but yeah. you're right. 
So that crazy suit um, is mentioned five minutes before it is rolled out, maybe 10 minutes. I don't know what it is, but yeah. normally, you know, you bring that thing up in the first act or at least earlier in the film mm. and kind of place it in a way that it doesn't feel like, oh my God, we need to get her in the crazy suit, <laughs> but we forgot to write it before. So, uh, oh yeah, we'll just manufacture a weird scene where they can discover the suit and add it in like 10 minutes before we need it. Yeah. The cheetah thing, so that's a character in, in the, the, the comics. Well, wow. it's... <laughs> Well, this is the danger of doing a podcast in a public space, I suppose. They're saying to evacuate. They're not saying... They're not saying it's a test. <laughs> wow. Legit. I guess we do. Yeah, I guess so. Stu we'll see. There's a lot of people in movies right we'll now who are now way. evacuating. And I guess we are as well. Okay, well... We're back. <laughs> we're now sitting outside the cinema. The complex. We're in the Pentridge prison yard. Yep. After a massive evacuation, there's people milling about everywhere. People getting uh, their tickets refunded and yep. that sort of jazz. We still don't know what's going on, but luckily we made it through the film. I know, but we were only halfway through our podcast, <laughs> and we've lost our our drinks. And we've lost our drinks. We had to mm. scull our drinks and then come down the escalator as quickly <laughs> as possible, <laughs> carrying our tripods and everything. Yeah. Oh well. What do you do? The show must go on. That's what we do here. That reminds me of. I've completely forgotten what we were talking about. I have, I have no idea. So, I, but I do have another question for you. Yes, please. I love your questions. The film starts off with a parable of sorts. Yes. And I just wanted to know what you thought about that. Yeah, I had very specific feelings about it. And tell us about that. <laughs> okay, so it starts off with some narration, and we all know how much we love narration on this show, <laughs> um, generally. True. Uh, and I thought that the narration part of it, I didn't like the tone of. Like, it, it opened it in a really Gal Gadot, earnest I can't even remember way. it. What was it? It was, you know, back... You know, when I was a little girl in yeah, the Amazon okay. world. No. Just that. And it was unnecessary. And we, it, it never happens again in the film. That's it's right. just at the beginning. It never happens. Which is, is, a, is, a, is a signpost of a problem with narration, I it would is. say. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the, the other part, I must say, aside from the narration, which yeah. I didn't like at the very start, that opening sequence with the little girl, I loved. Oh, okay. Interesting. I really, I really liked it. Uh, just for the, the thrill of it, the action of it. I thought she was really engaging. She just had a, like a cute cute face and it was just I, I liked her yeah uh, I thought I thought she was a good match for like a baby girl like you, you could was. you could believe it so that's a good start yeah uh, oh everybody's going back into the <laughs> cinema everybody no there I like go. I like our new spot now so yeah we're staying here what did you think well okay so the island of the Amazons mm. I've forgotten the name of the island but it's the island that's hidden in the middle of the ocean where they sort of have their own little society of only women mm. and they're all warriors and they're all training all the time mm. but not really engaging with any battles ever. Yeah, yeah. I had problems with that concept and I had problems with the, with the way it was done in the first film. Yes. In fact, it's sort of the first act of the film yep. and it, it's the weak link for me. Like it was looked the fakest, it felt the the, the most cartoony yeah uh, and I had a little bit of that problem again like I didn't love it and I remember thinking last time I could have just skipped all of that even mm. though we kind of needed it for Chris Pine's character to come crashing in and for the world to sort yep. of get Wonder Woman out of her little bubble and the reason I didn't love it in this film is that they were presenting to us a parable mm. that would set up the film yeah. except strangely the parable didn't really seem to apply to Wonder Woman herself. It applied to, I would say, more the villain and Cheetah Lady or whatever her character's name, uh, you know, whatever her character is. Like it applied to them more, I think. This idea of sort of skipping past and like just, I wanna be the winner, I wanna have it all and I'm gonna skip the steps and I'm gonna get there as quickly as I can. That seemed to be mm. what we were getting at, right? Y yes, yeah, that's what it was. You, you don't win by cheating. Yeah. I'd argue that it applied to Wonder Woman as well. Yeah. Uh, because there's no easy way to get the love of her life back. And she had to make a choice for truth. Yeah. So she lost lost him again. Like it's not as yes. extreme as the other ones, but I yeah. think it still resonated. I would go with you on that if 
Wonder Woman had knowingly made the wish, knowing it would actually come true. But she did it in a like a, yeah, I kind of wish that I had <laughs> the love of my life back again. Not knowing that she was holding the stone that was going to make that very wish come true. Yeah. And there was a bit of like, okay, I'm not going to let him go now that I've got him. So there was that. But the other characters, it, it felt like they were more complicit in the cheating than Wonder Woman was. Yeah, probably. Um, Wonder Woman did a, a, a mirrored version of her hissy, hissy fit when she was a kid, though, when she was saying, I'm not going to let him go. You know, this is, this is the one thing that I've always wanted and I'm going to keep it and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So she had to make a decision. She did at some And that point. decision was based in the fact that she's such a, you know, good person yep. based on that history that we saw at the start. I like, thought that was all crappy, but that's, I think that's... It was crappy. It, it pulls together for me. It does. The mo okay, let's talk about that, though, because that was one of the segments, the sections of the film that bothered me the most, was the world has fallen to, to complete chaos mm. in 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, people started wishing, and it yeah. all just went horribly wrong instantly. And there's the whole sequence where her and... Chris Pine are walking down the street and the mum's just picked her kids up from soccer but now she's on the side of the road and they're eating like the last sandwiches that they'll ever eat <laughs> and and like there's chaos and r running wild in the streets and some guy who wished for a farm and now he's got two cows he has to look after and doesn't oh, know what to do we, about can it. Can we go back a step? Because <laughs> yeah. this is important. Yeah, okay. The whole film hinges on this dark crystal thingy. Yes. That allows you to touch it and make a wish. Yeah. It's friggin' ridiculous. Yeah. I, and I know these are superhero movies and you've got to suspend belief and there's people from different planets and all that sort of stuff. But once you buy into that world, fair enough. I just feel that just touching something and wishing is too flimsy a thing to hold this together. Doesn't hold up anymore. It doesn't. It, and it's, it's, a, it's no. more a kid's fairy tale than something that you know, us mature heroes, <laughs> yeah. sort of people, worshipping people. Hero worshipping <laughs> modern day fanboys. Yeah. yeah, we can't go for that ride. It, uh, yeah, it just it seemed a bit silly for me. And, and from yeah. that, that is the instigator for all those ludicrous things that you're referring to later. I agree. I agree. And it felt like just on a writing level, every time they wanted something to happen, it happened instantly in this film. Yeah. Like, it's like, I need the world to now be completely chaotic so that Wonder Woman can make her decision to sort of release Chris Pine. So it's the most ridiculous, the most chaotic yeah. version of that possible. And it happens instantly, instantly. The, the second they need it. And that happens the whole way through the film. Not quite. Not okay. quite, because when they don't want it to happen instantly, it doesn't freaking <laughs> happen doesn't. instantly. <laughs> When's that? Such as when Wonder Woman, yeah, she, yes, she instantly gets her, her lover back. Yeah. But she doesn't instantly lose her power. Like The, the oh, power true. just sort of seeps away from her gradually. You're right. You Everyone know? else loses everything they, they've everything ever had straight away. Everything else happens instantly. Although, yeah. But her, her journey is, oh, no, she's gradually losing her power. Yeah, that's true. It's true. And the cheetah lady, uh, we need a better name for her. I'm sure I've got it somewhere. Well, I just thought of her as Minerva. I thought Minerva was meant to be, because she's Dr. Minerva, wasn't she? Yeah, that, she was. That sounds super heroic. That does. To me. So I thought that was the character's name and I didn't understand yeah. why she turned into a cat. Yeah. And also che cheetahs are not apex predators. Just, there's a few flaws here. <laughs> and we were starting to talk about, that's right, why she suddenly becomes a cheetah yeah. out of nowhere. All these things not really set up properly or paid mm. off. I think you're meant to just go for the ride. I think that's what Patty Jenkins and co are mm. hoping for here is that you will just be enthused by the idea of all of this stuff mm. happening and you'll kind of go with the ride and forget some of the details. Was there, was there any portion of your soul that did go along for the ride? I was finding it so hard. The, the bit that I enjoyed the most, mm. and I think it's a little bit because I'm a, I think I'm a little bit into Chris Pine. I think he's a cool dude. Okay. And I enjoy watching him take on these different sorts of characters. And he has those dreamy blue eyes that I can't stop looking at. <laughs> but watching him 
dress up in 1980s gear and then discover everything that the, the yeah. future is bought brought but it's all 80s stuff oh you like that i enjoyed that sequence oh crikey i went for the ride i hate it <laughs> that's it. when it really dropped it for me I thought, <laughs> well, this is like a little montage in the middle it was let's let's morph into that reminds me of yeah it reminded me of kind of the terminator coming to that's town, exactly what it was uh, or uh, is it encino man <laughs> <laughs> when yes. you know any anyone that's plonked into a new life or the what what's the <laughs> film where it was is it wayne's world or was it bill and ted's where all the the historical figures come back. Bill and Ted's. Bill and Ted's. Yeah. No, that's exactly what it was. And I, I loved it for that reason. I think that's why I loved it. And it was some of the fun, a little bit of the sprinkling of fun that I was hoping that we'd get through in some of the rest of the film that we didn't. Mm. Well, speaking of sprinkling of fun, mm. what did you think about the, really the second sequence? So we, we started with that backstory bit with the young, yeah. young Diana. Then we go into the mall scene which is neon technicolor mall 80s mall right a scene with over the top crooks robbing a, a jewelry store yeah what did you make of it well on one level i love that they went for it mm. i love that it went it went all out it felt out of place in this film to mm. me and i couldn't quite fit it in yeah. with the rest of the film because it was very bubblegummy and just ridiculous and mm. and and fun not funny but fun. I was enjoying it mildly, but at the same time, I was also concerned for where the film was going because yeah, we had just started off with Amazon Island, whatever that island's called, which was already bothering me. And then we were now doing a full on 80s action mall sequence yeah. with, you know, guys that don't know how to hold guns properly and are just goofy in that 80s style. And yeah, and Wonder Woman's just over the top saving the day when actually with those guys who were just a bunch of random thugs she probably could have just rounded them up just yeah pushed them all into a circle or something and tied them up with a rope where she's doing like flips and adds all this unnecessary danger in the situation Why throws them out the this? window yes they they all land from like stories up yeah they land on a car yeah and, and they're, they're all fine dead. they should and have all been a, dead it's <gasps> just all a big joke oh, 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 look at them struggling to get out of the rope I would love to see some sort of piss take of that where you see actually how horribly wrong that whole setup would have oh, gone. I'll play it real. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, that kid would have been, had her arms broken when she got flung across the room and yeah, uh, wow. the guys would have had all their limbs torn off and their necks broken and odd pitch choices. The whole thing was a little sort of mm. off. And that was one after another. It is as though they had two different short films. And then, of course, the next thing you see is Kristen Wiig w walking into the Smithsonian and what, what they've done is the classic, which is kind of more of a 90s thing, mm. the, um, the geek who's unsavable, who th they're going to now sort of dress up and make look um, yeah. like a knockout, you know. That old one, this is, yeah. this is a really good film for that reminds me of. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> because I, I didn't even pick specific films sometimes, but I, it's just whole sub-genres of films that they're just alluding to, yeah. and stitching together. Yeah, so I think we should get into remind me of. I will just say one last thing about Patty Jenkins, unless you got more to say. No, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. Um, so she's been quite lauded, I think, for Wonder Woman. Yeah. And I think that some of these weird choices, and they're both writing and directing choices, and mm. tonally just odd choices, um, are concerning. And I don't, I don't know if she's as great a director as she is, perhaps. Um, someone who who's going to sort of hold the banner for bringing in this first female superhero and really see that vision through. And I think she's done that really, really well. And there's a lot in there that's great. But just as a film, that mm. through history, we're going to look back on and think, you know, are those well-made films? I just don't know if they're, they're really that great, you know? No, well, I didn't think this one was that great. No. It had even little things like the, the CGI and stuff just looked a bit odd sometimes. Mm. Like, if it was style choices, I'd forgive it. But sometimes Wonder Woman looked like a, an 80s video game. Yeah. Like, when, yeah. She, when, you know, when she was running real fast at some stage, yeah. and it just looked, she didn't look real. Bit off. There were similar issues in the first film. Same, same yeah, okay. stuff. Same sort of things going on. Yeah, and I would have bought it if it was a consistent stylistic choice. Yeah. It just didn't feel like it was. It felt like it was maybe 
I don't know, not enough budget in it or something. Yeah, which is crazy because it would have had all the budget in the world. Yeah. But yeah, again, I would put that down to maybe a bit of a direction thing. Mm. I did think of one other thing. Pedro Pascal, the guy yes. who plays Max Lord. Yes. So I've just recently finished off The Mandalorian. Yes. And he's, he's the Mandalorian underneath the mask in that. Um, and then the other thing I saw him in just randomly was, uh, it's not Spy Kids, it's like a new Spy Kids type film that Robert Rodriguez has made. Yes. I'm just blanking on the name of it. But suddenly I'm seeing him everywhere. And I think he's a great actor. And I am really looking forward to what he does mm. in some more serious roles. But I liked him in The Mandalorian, even though you barely see him. And I could see glimpses of greatness in this performance. And I think he was bringing his all to a very ridiculous character mm. and pulling it off in a, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think so. He reminded mm. me of Brando. Yeah, he's got times. a Brando sort, sort of, of his face. Yeah, his face, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Sort of, you know, Dick and the set, intensity's sort of, there too. It is. Mm. Yeah, he really buys into it. But the the character I know him for is uh, in Game of Thrones. Oh, really? Yeah. So he plays a really pivotal character. I'm trying to remember him in Game of um, Thrones. What's his name? I can't remember his name, but. Uh, his character in Game of Thrones reminds me of the, the character in The Princess Bride. My name is... Uh, <laughs> Inigo Montoya. Yeah, yeah. You killed my father for a better day. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Because <laughs> uh, he basically plays a more serious version of that character in Game of Thrones. Oh, wow. You know, with a revenge lust. I love it. And I, I think he was in Narcos as well, which I never saw. Yeah. It's probably, that's probably the, the serious dramatic role that we're... That we're looking for <laughs> anyway he's good he's got presence and he this does. was a ludicrous character though and it was oh, ridiculous uh just hard to play uh before we get to that to the, the reminds part of it the scene towards the end like it all just went silly towards the end didn't it like yeah every if everyone is making wishes someone just make a wish to stop it all or to reverse it or right like it, the logic anyway <laughs> exactly. that aside that's a throwaway comment but she is taught whispering and then he is yelling back they're having a conversation at completely different levels and i know that i know that that was a bit the joke because she was talking somehow via him to this to everyone on, on earth because it's convenient her truth uh whip whatever that thing's called lasso that's what it is suddenly allows her to talk to the world via his leg yeah, no, they really, when, when they invented <laughs> that truth lasso golden whip, yeah. they, they really thought of everything. They did. Mm. It's pretty good. It's I pretty love good. how, how it's it... It's Bluetooth enabled as well. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. And it, she flings, oh, here's a couple of other things. She flings the lasso to lightning bolts. A great point. She can fly, but sometimes, even though she's just learned how to fly, she still likes to swing off lightning bolts. But can she fly? Can, can the original Wonder Woman fly? Well, I don't, I'm not down with the comic enough, but she learnt, my, my take is yeah. she learned how to fly because Trevor the Guy, the pilot said, it's all about wind and stuff. Of course it is. Uh, and she was like, oh, it's all about wind and it's stuff. Wind, and yeah. then she was like, okay. And off she goes, she just starts flying. Oh, that unnerved me. Yeah, um, unnerved me as well. Didn't unnerve me quite as much as the origin story for the invisible plane again again oh, yeah, okay one, one, two two <laughs> two deus ex machina type things there's been there's, there's so many of them but yeah. yes it's like somebody went in the writer's room they're just going to steal a plane because they need to get to egypt yeah okay that's probably not the simplest way to get to egypt but all right yeah. um oh it's a jet fighter which of course the second they take it off every every military things going to be pointing at them right and then she just remembers radar she, she literally goes oh i forgot there's radar or i something. forgot there's radar <laughs> but don't worry for the last 30 years i've been practicing my invisibility trick on a coffee mug on a coffee mug i know and i've got it i think i've got it just about down pat i've only done it once before <laughs> but i think i can make this whole plane disappear <laughs> oh and here's another one let's fly the, the jet through fireworks, which is not at all the most dangerous thing you could think of doing with a jet. Oh, <laughs> it's right, just, I don't know. Anyway, uh, do we move on to what it reminded us Let's of? Let's do. I, I think what we've covered here mm. is that there are little little snippets of gold throughout this film, but there's also a lot of just crazy, <laughs> ridiculous, batshit 
who thought of that type of yeah. stuff in there? Anyway, yeah, maybe that scene when they're flying through the fireworks is a good one for me to start with because it reminded me of the superhero films of, you know, the late 70s, early 80s. I'm thinking mainly the Supermans. Yep. Uh, and that scene was one of those silly ones where in the middle of all the havoc, Superman and, you know, takes Lois Lane on a romantic flight, you know, through the city. So that seems like what they were trying to emulate. Yeah, um, that, that was the romantic moment of lights and flying. And I think more than just that scene, there was just that vibe of corniness mm -hmm. sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, I think they were, they were shooting for, for that era. When she learns to fly, and I don't know who ever would do this in mm. reality, like if you could fly, just imagine, mm. cast your mind to your flying. Is there anything in you that would want to put one fist out <laughs> and one fist on your hip? <laughs> why, is there any reason why you would do that other than to say, not only can I fly, but I can punch shit with this fist and I'm powerful and I'm, yeah. I'm on a mission to go do that. I feel like Wonder Woman's probably seen the Superman films of the, <laughs> of the 80s and realised yeah. that he does, does that. That's what he does. It just makes sense. Yeah. Just some very specific things relating to the Superman films too was in one of the Supermans, uh, Clark Kent loses his power and is beaten up by a few thugs, I think, in a bar. Yeah. And then when he gets his power back, I think he has his day in court, basically, and, and beats him up from memory. Um, <laughs> but that reminded me of Kristen Wiig getting, you know, harassed by that bloke in the park and then coming back and yeah. beating him up. Yeah, of course. And and Wonder Woman losing her power in this as, as yes. one of the story plot lines. Yeah. Yeah. So when we got the idea of this truth rock thing, mm -hmm. the Dark Crystal, um, the first thing that popped into my head was, oh, it's Monkey Paw. And it's la that's later then referred to in the film. Yeah. Um, which is good because I think that get, gets I, across. I don't, under, I don't know Monkey Paw. I don't oh, you don't know? It's, 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 it's a take on the genie yeah. in the bottle myth. Um, it's a darker take where, you know, you wish for a loved one to come back and, mm. of course, they come back as a zombie as opposed uh, to yeah, yeah, the yeah. way that you want them to come back. Yeah. It's a be careful of what you wish for. I, I, I was thinking about that and then I started thinking uh, about Aladdin, which is the genie myth. Again, another wish one, mm. but um, in the Disney's Aladdin, the ultimate thing that happens with the evil sorcerer is that he wishes to become the genie himself, which is ah. his undoing because that makes him get sucked into the little bottle. And that very much reminded me of this film. And of course, that's kind of in its roundabout way what happens here. Mm. Um, the guy wishes, Max, pa isn't Max, Max Lord wishes mm. to become the... the the genie, basically, the dark mm. crystal himself. And of course, that becomes his undoing after a, a time. That's a good one. I think that's nailed it. I had thought the same about the Aladdin yeah. similarities, but only the surface level of you making wishes, which I have always thought is ridiculous. But that gives it a little bit more to yeah, go on. There's that. a little bit more there. Mm. Totally. What else you got? I've got, uh, again, this is a genre rather than a film, and I'll, I'll ask you what films <laughs> Uh, fit in the genre, but any of the ones where the, the people change bodies, uh, such as Big, or he doesn't really change bodies, but he grows yes. up. Yes. Um, trading places. Trading places. Uh, there was a free, is it Freaky Friday? Yeah, um, there's, there's a whole lot where the guy and the girl. 30. No, that's, that's the same as Big. Uh, <laughs> the guy and the girl switch yeah. somehow. Yeah, totally. But a million of those. So that was yep. just another little version, another little movie inserted into into this film. Yeah, and there was potential for more comedy there. I think Chris Pine's the better actor and he's the one you want to see. Mm. Um, instead of playing him looking like yeah, the new guy the whole way through, which would have been cheaper for their budget, mm. they, um, they, they, they show him to start off with and you get the one glimpse in the mirror, but otherwise it's Chris Pine the whole way through. Yeah, I thought they okay. played that okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, it's, it's, there, there are too many ideas in this film already so you probably mm. don't want them to to play with that that's a whole film in itself right we've seen yeah. that, that film so many times yeah and and i thought this yeah the stuff that you liked i hate it you hate it anyway yeah. that's great i love it um okay so this is a film i saw two days ago yeah soul it's a new disney oh, yes pixar film have wow. you seen it yeah we'll have to i haven't seen it but i'm looking forward to it so it, it could be an, it should be an episode in its own right for us but yeah. 
Um, shall I get into it? Yes, but yeah. not, don't spoil it, maybe. Okay, I won't spoil it, but it has the theme of a starving artist mm. who's, a, who's actually quite a good music teacher, um, but wants to be a jazz, uh, like a famous jazz musician in New York. He ends up very early in the film dying, that's the whole mm. premise, um, and then going on a mission to get back into his body so that he can, he can basically have this gig that he had just lined up before he died. Okay. Um, but the whole premise, the whole kind of heart of this film is this idea of, of destiny and what you think is your destiny and how it's this thing in the future that's going to be hard to obtain. And because of that thing, you forget all of the little day-to-day -day life things that are great that you already have, that yeah. you should be enjoying because you're looking into the future too much. I felt like that was very much the same, the same sort of point that mm. we were getting to it was the don't cheat to get to the end you got to enjoy all the moments you got to live those moments and earn it mm. very similar themes soul just in classic pixar storytelling style is so much more nuanced yep. and pointed and focused than, than this film mm. it comes anywhere near you know so you recommend that one so yeah maybe we should do an episode yeah some stage yeah definitely when you're saying uh, you know not to cheat that just made me think that Kristen Wiig became the cheater. She did become the cheater. Is that, is that on purpose? That's a great call. That's a great call. It's no more ridiculous than anything else in the film. They went, you know what, let's use the <laughs> cheater and it works because we'll tell her, we'll tell Wonder Woman not to cheat in scene one. <laughs> Love it. Uh, what else have I got? I had a, a reference to Buffy. I hate, I hate these explaining the backstory and the history moments of these sorts of films or TV shows or whatever. But when, when they're looking for the history of the, the, the crystal and A, Kristen Wiig goes and does her research and finds like newspaper articles and stuff of 40,000 years ago. And it's all and like perfectly drawn, the crystal, like exactly like the one that yes, you've seen that's right. in, in hieroglyphics, in hieroglyphics. everything else is hieroglyphic style. There's like this perfectly etched, you know. So what, <laughs> what search terms did she use in what system to yes. find out everything that she, she, she she's basically got the full 40,000 year history of this crystal within <laughs> half a day. And this is in the 80s. In the 80s, yeah. yeah she's looking she through can't microfilm. Even Google. <laughs> um, so that was one, yeah, one um, moment where that that just trying to explain the backstory. Then the other was when um, Wonder Woman herself was reading through some book and just worked it all out, you know, yep. within five seconds. And I hate that crap. I hate that crap and too. It, it reminds me of Buffy, which I, I liked Buffy, but every episode was a version of that. And Buffy, the whole universe revolved around that, that kind of craziness. So that's, that's true. In a way, it was, you just forgave it. It was fine. It was part yeah. of the fun. But don't insert it into no. what is meant to be a film that makes sense in, exactly. it, in its own exactly. world. Exactly. Here's a final thought. Like, do you think that we are in any way two blokes that have gone to see Woman, Wonder Woman 1984 and have missed the point? <laughs> I just want to... Mm. I think I think we get the point. I'm, I'm not sure I can articulate the point, but it, mm. other than to say, it's clearly meant to be a fun movie. Yeah, it's not meant to be taken too seriously. Yeah, the problem is that sometimes it does take itself too seriously. Yeah, and particularly the Wonder Woman character for me is just too serious. Full stop. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know that we've missed the point, to be honest. Or if it's a tonal issue or something else, sort of mm. that's that script slash direction level yeah. yeah do you think we've missed the point look i don't think we've missed the point but i always feel mm. the pressure these days to consider whether or not <laughs> yeah. i've missed the point <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah, i mean yeah. yeah yeah i mentioned superman before just one other scene that reminded me of that was the when he spins the world on his you know go spins the world the, the other way yeah and just fixes everything. That's basically <laughs> what happened at the end. Yes. There's all calamity everywhere. And just with one, I renounce my wish. It's all solved. Massive spoiler, but um, we've already spoiled tons anyway. But mm. that whole concept at the very end of the film, that Wonder Woman can speak to the world and appeal to their better nature to mm. undo the wish that they've just made. And everybody does it. That was the most preposterous thing that of all the preposterous things, I was just like, how does that, yeah. you know, how do we expect that that's going to happen? You know? 
you anyway. know, it's funny. It it really does remind me of Gal Gadot's Imagine mm. video. Yeah. Like the tone of it, whenever she's involved, it gets so earnest. I think you said before, and yeah, trying to trying to throw messages in there. It's as though she's in there or someone is in there in the script sessions and trying to insert love, hope, and truth and yeah, all this stuff in there where you'd be much better off with wisecracks. Yes. For I agree. this particular, either wisecracks or a darkness and a you know, a gritty Batman-esque sort of thing. It's the problem with a character like Wonder Woman or Superman. They're too perfect and therefore it really hard to relate to. I'd, I'd disagree on Superman. I think Superman has a, the Christopher Reeve version anyway, he's got some goofiness and some, there's a lot <laughs> of humour. He does, you're right. And, and, and even um, Henry Cavill to, yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. So I've always related to Superman. <laughs> A little. Um, there you go. I've but, always found them tough, but it's, it's a good point. Yeah. There is a bit of goofiness there that we don't get in this one. No. Yeah. And I think she'd be capable of it. I think it would really yeah. loosen her up. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. I that, think we've covered it. Well, we've, we've had a we can. fun-filled episode <laughs> full of high drama and evacuations. And <laughs> I feel like this episode has probably, you know, been more more of a roller coaster than the film itself <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> oh well at least we got a uh, a drink in there that was yep. good before it all went to hell okay well i think we wrap up and maybe have another one yep sounds good cheers doc see you the next one see you baron